Thank you. Hi. Wow. I wish I could have an introduction like that every single day to start work because I think I would get a lot done. Um, now, they say how you start your mornings can set you up for success for your entire day. So I thought today I would start a little bit different and show you how I start my day with my two-year-old, which is two tomorrow, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. Can you say, I am glorious. I am powerful. I am smart. I am kind. And I am strong. everyone stand up for me and it might be hard for you guys up on the seat so you might just want to stay seated and I'm gonna run through some affirmations with you a little bit more adult less than more than one word <laughs> yeah. 100%. okay so I am healthy I am abundant I am fit and strong I am fit and strong. I am living in the paradise of my own creation. I am living in the paradise of my own creation. And last but not least, I am creative beyond measure. I am creative beyond measure. Now give me a life affirming Goldie. Yes. 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 Okay, everyone take a seat and let's dive in. <laughs> Thanks Goldie. Well done. So when Nick came to me with the theme treasure, Waggleton, please, sorry, I'm also unprofessional with my dog. When Nick came to me with the theme treasure, I automatically went to, it's you, it's me, it's us as a collective, we are the treasures. But that felt way too easy, way too easy. So I went on a bit of a creative spiral, as I tend to do, because I love to overthink things. And what I realized was during those really lengthy periods of time where you feel like the, the universe, you know, has you in its clutches with a white knuckling force, it is that same exact force that can turn your coal into diamonds. So today I would like to share a small chapter of my life where my uncomfortable growth has led me to some of my greatest treasures. Um, as Nick said, I'm a producer and director with nearly two decades of experience and I'm the founder of a photographic and interview series called Wild Fens. A little about me, I grew up on a farm in Kangaroo Ground near the Yarra Valley in Victoria and my daily life looked a little bit like Yellowstone but without like all the crime and the murder <laughs> and uh, you know, I was never an academic but I was creative. So this is me playing one half of Dr. Zeus's Cat in the Hat. I sticky taped those spots to my horse. And I feel like if that doesn't show you my earliest industrious nature or creativity, I'm really not sure what else will in this conversation. However, I went through school and much through my parents' disappointment, I was not going to be pursuing a career in farming or agriculture. My dad bred cattle and Clydesdales and I just didn't see that for me. Um, and like I said, I wasn't academic and my teachers told me from a really young age that my scores were probably not going to get me into university and that I should probably aim to get an admin role in a temp agency. And for me, at such a young age, having my career opportunities capped like that felt pretty deflating and I just, it wasn't for me. So I went straight into the workforce to try and find my place. Um, I realised pretty early on that I would have to remove my education from the front page of my CV. And if there's any HR or headhunters here, I'm really sorry, I hope this isn't insulting, but I could remove the education from the front page of my CV where I could sometimes, on a rare occasion, get past the interviewer and then rely on my witty charm to woo that manager. Now, one time it worked and I'll be forever grateful for that. I got the role as a personal assistant to the network EP at Channel 10 in Melbourne. And on my very first day, I came into work 
wearing my Q suit, you know, back in the day, we all, a Q suit with like a pencil skirt, you know, and a blazer into a production office. And if anyone's ever been into a TV production office, no one wears suits. Came in and uh, my boss said to me, Emma, I know you know fuck all about how to make television. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> I'm getting sacked like 10 minutes in. This is a record, like this is a record. But she said, it's fine, it's not rocket science, I'm gonna show you. And it, thanks to that woman, she instilled the business acumen, the, you know, the values and belief systems that I carry with me still today. And I still pester her as a mentor nearly 20 years on and I'm forever grateful that she put me on my career path that she has. So during the course of my career, I have been hired, I've been fired, I've been headhunted and I have begged for work because there is no shame in that game, let me tell you, in the freelance world. I'm sure we can probably all be a testament to that. I've been the producer on Australia's first big wave contest uh, with Mark Matthews for Red Bull. I've worked on some of Australia's biggest reality TV shows, such as The Voice, Gogglebox, First Dates, some other ones that I probably won't mention that gave me PTSD. <laughs> um, I, thought, I thought I was gonna die in a cattle muster in the heart of Wataka National Park. Sorry, excuse my daughter. In the heart of uh, Wataka National Park in the middle of Australia with Discovery UK, with Robson Green. I don't know if anyone knows him. Does anyone know Robson Green? Uh, I've directed some of our favorite Aussie media personalities such as Richard Wilkins, Carl Stefanovic, Sonia Kruger, and many more. I hiked uh, a mountain, like a kit mule for my DOP in the middle of monsoon season in Flores in Indonesia. I've worked on way too many Splendour in the Grasses. I produced a, with the help of actually Ruth Sayers, who's in the back there, uh, a live broadcast of a killer show for a private party for Amex uh, with one week's notice. That was stressful. And then eventually I attracted the eyes of an American media company to build a state-of-the-art live broadcast studio to create long form episodic content uh, for established titles such as Yahoo, Huffington Post, TechCrunch, Makers Women, and many more that they had under their brand. Now, um, that was amazing. I really felt like I'd found my rhythm in my career. I was in a really good place and we kicked some pretty great goals. I'd flown over to New York and brought back an American format called Build Series. And we were working with some of the best in uh, Australia and the world, like music, TV, the arts, everything. You know, we had Angus Stone, the Inspired Unemployed, we had Olivia Rodrigo, and you know, the uh, Travis Fimmel came back over to Australia. Variety of different, really, John Edwards, which is really interesting. Um, it was all going really, really well. And then 2020 came along, and uh, you know, it took a turn. And I'm sure everyone here had their own unique experience and impact from how the last few years have been. But my year looked a little bit like this and without going into too much granular detail, it was a wedding that made the headlines for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> weeks, please don't Google it. Um, <laughs> weeks, weeks and weeks, nearly months of unwanted media attention and what I'm calling rush journalism because basically it was all false. Uh, trolling by some poorly worded trolls with bad grammar. And also, side note, why do trolls always have bad grammar? Like, why? There's an art in there and there. Um, and, uh, you know, I got locked out of my studio for a whole year, which was so sad because America was not pioneering returning to work. It, they just weren't. So we were locked out and I had to turn all my high production value formats into Zoom interviews. But we did it. And then, heartbreakingly, my husband and I suffered a, uh, what's called a missed miscarriage. Um, it was very long, very traumatic. And then the straw that broke the camel's back for me was we got asked to move out of our home because the landlord wanted to move back in, in the middle of a pandemic, down on the cold coast where there was no real estate available. And we had this guy to think of. He was not gonna fit in a Bondi flat anymore. Um, so, with homelessness imminent, my husband and I actually, we bought a caravan and we moved half our life into a caravan and we toured up and down the east coast of Australia and I was, you know, conducting interviews. I think I interviewed Kate Miller-Heidke in the jungle 
of Tiona with a bush turkey in the background. <laughs> and she was saying to me, what's that? And I was like, it's nothing, I'm in my backyard. Just let's keep going. Couldn't tell her that I'm, you know, in a caravan. So it was a little squishy. Wags made life a little difficult at times, but we made it work. And my husband was affectionately calling it the rewilding of Emma. Because what I hadn't realised at the time, over the course of that year, was that all those little individual moments we're starting to chip away at me. And we're starting to chip away at my core and who I was. And you know the things that are like on autopilot? How to be positive in a negative or somewhat challenging situation. Or, you know, how to laugh at life. Or just how to like experience adrenaline and joy. Like those things were really starting to dwindle. I'd lost my fire and I felt like I'd lost my wild. So that trip for me really brought a lot of that back. Hi, baby. Um, sorry. Um, so it's true what they say though, that through adversity breeds new creativity and so it did. So what does a wacky creative, hi, what does a wacky creative woman do amidst all that chaos and emotional turmoil? Well, she creates more work for herself, obviously, in the form of a new creative outlet in a very challenging new medium, which she had neither the equipment or the skill sets. Um, and also happened to then call it a name and picked a niche style of photography that breaks all community guidelines. So challenging in many different areas, but few wild fans. So wild fans, <laughs> wild fans is the celebration of the female form through ethereal underwater imagery with strong, and feminine muses with a powerful storytelling component because we all have a story to share. And I'm just going to flip through some of these photos for you and I hope that they really evoke a sense of calm and a bit of wonder and maybe a little bit of freedom. So when I created Wild Fans, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I actually just created it for me. I needed a new creative outlet. I was searching for how to reignite my wild. But I had not anticipated the positive impact and overwhelmingly positive response that I could possibly get. And I'm just going to share a couple of the uh, uh, messages that I received from this. I was conquering my fear of showing my body and my choice to do do it was about owning my body, body as it is today and not waiting for it to be perfect. Because how many people here say, I'll be happy when? I'm a woman that's been raised to be very much reside in my masculine energy for a large part of my life. Yet M helped me surrender and relax more into the very feminine side of my soul and a part that I'm working on every single day to balance with my masculine. And now this one is a little bit heavy, but I felt like it was really worth sharing with a series of life-dealing cards, good and bad, from sexual assault to diagnosed endometriosis to self-bullying equating to fad diets and exercise programs. The stories I told myself about myself reflected in what I saw in the mirror. Meeting Emma came at a time where I was turning a corner and rewriting the narrative of my own self-body image. She and Wild Fans was a part of that healing journey. Like, I didn't realise I could have that impact. And what better fuel to keep me driving and to keep me going forward. This also opened up the doors. <laughs> I'm trying so hard to concentrate here, but she's a little distracting at times. This also opened up the doors for me to connect with more women on a global scale. Uh, uh, Executive leadership and women's retreats such as She Evolved invited me to come out to Fiji and talk and shoot with some of their attendees. And the experience of getting in the water with someone and allowing them to shed off, not just physically, but emotionally, it was freeing. And I, I get the sense that we all need a little bit of liberation every now and then. So with this in mind, I realised if I felt like this, I'm sure that other people felt like this as well. And gentlemen, whilst this series is about women for women, I just want you to know that the practicing principles and values instilled in this series apply to everyone and the tips that I'll share now can be used for all. So I pulled together 
and tapped into my resources as a producer and director and reached out to some of the women in my community that inspire, motivate and empower. And these women are making an impact in their own unique ways. And I think it's glorious. Like they are just trying to thrive and they're staying in their lane and it's beautiful. So this is me with Charlotte Chimes and one of my first uh, interview series, uh, interview episodes. So today I'm gonna to share with you a few tips that are so basic, like it's so basic that it's silly, but like when you are under duress, when you are stressed or tired or feeling the weight of something quite emotional, what are the, like the four things that go out the window during that time? Movement, nourishment, sleep hygiene, you know, and the ability to just stay happy, right? So Vanessa Buddha, she's a global PR and communication specialist. And for anyone here, does anyone here know Vanessa actually? Yeah. For anyone that knows Vanessa, knows that she is such a force in the most beautiful, playful way. Like, I've ne I never see her without a smile on her face. But her number one tip was stay playful. Find ways to thread that through your every day. And I guess that's the same as kind of, you know, making the mundane joyful. Like, how do you bring that into those moments? So that's something to think about. And I try to think about that every day now. Emma Taylor. She's a naturopath that specialises in women's fertility awareness and education. Um, something that I've always admired about Emma is, besides the incredible work that she does with women who are struggling to conceive, is that she has incredible, impeccable boundaries and they are so respectful. If you email her on a day where she's not working, the bounce back says, I only work these days and I will only email on these days, so don't expect an email any other day. Right, and it's so basic, but it just cuts out all the noise. Caroline Groth, she's a wellness advocate, she's a content creator, and she's also a health coach. Um, she speaks very vulnerably about many aspects of her life, disordered eating, her gut health and her healing journeys, um, you know, her relationships. She shares it all, and I really respect that aspect of her, but she said, and I think this is really key, it is, don't speed track your healing. If there is work to be done, do it properly. And I, I hate the term work. Like I hate the term work. It makes it seem like it's bad or something. <laughs> but you just got to do it because those things will keep popping up if you don't heal with them now. Wow, Zoe Condliffe. This woman, if you don't know who she is, I highly recommend you follow her because she is someone who is going to make an impact on the world. She is the founder and CEO of She's a Crowd. Um, it is the... I never say this right, largest geospatial data mapping tool to, with the sole mission to end gender-based violence. It's truly incredible. And she's almost created like a circular healing where people share their unfortunate experiences, but it, like, it's like a weight lifts off them. So they're helping other people not get hurt and they're healing themselves at the same time. Charlotte Chimes. She's an actress, she's a producer and writer. You might know her as Nicolette Stone of Neighbours if we have any fans here today. <laughs> she, something that I love about Charlotte, and if anyone here knows her, she is so authentically herself. In email, on the phone, on set, working with me as a producer, like whatever aspect it is, she is just authentic. So she said, stay true to yourself and authentically who you are. The weight of trying to be someone you're not can be overwhelming. And it's true. Dr. Olivia Lesler. Now I have a bit of a, my husband knows this, I have a bit of a crush on her because I actually met her through my husband's charity, Skin Check Champions. She was doing skin checks for him. Um, but she is one of Australia's best functional medicine doctors. She specializes in psychoneuroimmunology, biohacking, sleep hygiene, uh, chronic illnesses and mystery, you know, sorry, chronic diseases and mystery illnesses. You know, she's really, truly a rare phenomenon but for her it's about staying connected she said don't lose touch and that's one of the things we also forget to do when we're having hard times is that we forget to stay connected to our communities like this so i think this year alone she's she's spoken at and been to maybe 30 conferences around the world because she just loves it it feeds her soul and it's good that you understand what does 
Leah Simmons. She's the founder of Kaya Training and often a trainer to celebrities and high profile people around Australia. Now, you would assume someone who specializes in meditation and breath work and yoga and all these different things for them to be so Zen like and to have like these impeccable morning routines. But she's just like you and me, you know, she's got kids. Some days it's daycare drop off. Some days she's, you know, sleeping in some days she's doing a class. So like she said, if an opportunity presents itself, say yes, don't be so rigid in an outcome because sometimes it might work in your favor. Sophie Marshall. Now, has anyone here heard of This Is Incense? The incense brand? Does anyone know? Oh, you definitely got to know. She's got a multi-million dollar incense brand called This Is Incense, or it's under the umbrella company now called Gentle Habits. So her company grew dramatically fast, scaled quickly, and she said, don't take yourself too seriously. She shared with me a few stories from her business where basically it was very costly uh, in time and money. And she said, all you had to do was just laugh and fail fast and move on because what else could you do? What else? And I thought that was really important. Hey Goldie. Now, Pamela Anderson, haven't interviewed her yet. I'm hunting her down as I speak. But I did just recently, yeah, I've, yeah I'm on INDB Pro emailing all her contacts every day. Now, I just read her book recently and it was so poetically written. She's incredible and she didn't ghostwrite it. She, had, she wrote it herself. But something she said, well, she, she called herself a seeker. She said she loves being around people and learning from them, like new uh, natural therapies and new ways of learning and education, all these things. And I actually really resonated with that. I think I'm a seeker. But she also said, find your own soothing techniques. We can't all be Deepak Chopra's, okay? Like, I can't meditate. But I do this like weird shower thing where I do my breath work in the shower and it works for me. And I feel good. It starts my day good, right? And I thought that was really good. So sit with that. Don't feel bad about not being able to do your yoga or your whatever and find out what works for you. Because when in those hard times when you need to self-regulate and keep the truck moving forward, that'll come in really handy. Now, I'm not sure if you remember, but back in 2004, Doug released a campaign called Real Beauty where it was the first, well, I, for me personally, I remember it being one of the first campaigns I saw where they had diversity of age, shape and ethnicity. It was truly wonderful. They also ran a case study alongside the campaign and released the results. In a global survey of women from all around the world, only 2% of those women thought they were beautiful. 2%, like, that's a damn crime. Crazy, right? So, my last tip in this little space today is Self-love is a really trendy term at the moment. It gets thrown around a lot. But self-love is not quick. It's something that is a works in progress for the rest of your life. However, self-respect is not. You can start that right now. Be mindful of the language that you're using internally and externally. I became very aware of this when I had a daughter because I realized I'm quite um, self-deprecating. And whilst I'm saying it, you know, saying it in jest, it's still being said and like what you say, even in jest, you, you know, the body mind spirit connection is alive and thriving and it listens. So just start changing the language you use, start being more respectful to yourself. Cause like you wouldn't give your client bad press. So why would you give yourself bad press? Like it doesn't make any sense really when you think about it. So I think Robin Sharma said it best. Change is hard at first, messy in the middle, and gorgeous at the end. And I think that's what uncomfortable growth is. It's change. And if you can push that change in a positive direction, it will push you to elevate as a person. Holistically, in your relationships, in your craft, your emotional mastery. You know, you can really use these times to become better in every single way. Um, I just wanted to share this photo. So <laughs> it's me looking like a whale, actually. It's like not being mean to myself, but just quite big. I was about 39 weeks pregnant here and I had my last shoot before I was giving birth. I had to get 
a, like a super large men's wetsuit. And then I had to get three people to put, it was in the middle of winter, I had to get three people to like heave me into it. And then I had to get another photographer to come out in the water with me because I couldn't actually, to like help push me down. Like I couldn't get under the water, like I was so buoyant. Gold, Goldie was massive, you know, she was over four kilos when she was born. So I was like, it was massive. But I remember just like crawling out on my hands and knees and like sitting on the beach being like, oh yeah, I think I got it. I think I got it. And everyone, they took that photo of me. I cropped it a bit because everyone was quite naked in the background. But I really think that's a photo for me that symbolises what Wild Fems is about. Like the whole community had to come together to A, get the shots, B, in the shots, and then help me like get underwater to take the shots. And I really think that's a really nice moment. So what is next for me in Wild Fens? Well, on Tuesday, I actually leave for Montenegro, which I have never been before. Super excited. I'm going to be shooting, at, I'm in the photographer in residence at a retreat called the Samudra Collective. And the retreat is called She and the Sea. And it's all about women's connection to water. And they reached out to me and I just, it felt like simpatico. Um, I'm in pre-production now for season two. So I'm currently casting for that. And I'm working on some really special editorial features that are going to, going to be coming out towards the end of this year. Now, if you would like to follow the journey or reach out and connect with me, I would love to hear from you. I love chatting with everyone and creating new creative outlets and opportunities. And in summary, what I would like to say is, I hope that you find your wild and I hope that you find your treasures through any stage of life. And this is where my year of uncomfortable growth really did lead me to some, to some beautiful times because I have wild fans. I get to connect with inspiring women every single day, whether in the water or out. And also I have my beautiful baby girl after having a miscarriage. And now I'm creating the life by design that I've dreamt of. You know, you have those moments where you go, wow, I actually manifested this like I asked for this I didn't ask for it like this but I asked for it and it's happening so I hope that you all find your wild and your treasures too so thank you so much <laughs>
for the first little while. And luckily, Scotty is very supportive of my um, wacky creative ideas when they come about. So, um, yeah, so I was just heavily relying on Shannon to sort of teach me the ropes. Like, I mean, it's probably worth saying I'm not a trained photographer. I'm self-taught in that space and I've just asked a lot of questions. So once I felt really comfortable with Shannon's gear and she, <laughs> she was comfortable with, like, letting me use it, you know, without flooding it, um, I then just invested in my own kit and that's a slow process and I think it's you know you don't have to have the whole you know obviously you need the water housing but you don't have to have all the most expensive uh, equipment straight off the bat um, like uh, Aquatech actually make this thing called an Axis Go that can go over your phone and that thing takes a great photo like my first couple of chapters in the Wild Fems when it started it was just chapters and the first couple of chapters I shot just on my phone and that was that was amazing so um, I think you just have to start. I think that's the point really is like you don't have to be perfect You just have to start and then when you feel like it has legs you can keep pursuing it And I started to realize very quickly from the response that yeah, I think I was onto something and I should trust my gut with this one because You know, uh, oh, that's actually what I didn't say about Zoe. So that's actually her tip I actually just talked about it, but didn't give her tip. So basically she relies on intuitive business. Like she's a CEO in a tech startup space, but she relies on intuitive business because she thinks that your intuition is your learned experience and that we need to connect to that and trust it more. So I think in the creative space, that's really important because you can have a lot of people telling you what to do. You can be influenced by a lot of people on Instagram. You know, there's so much, you're flooded with stuff. But I think it's really important to know in your gut, if you're like, I think this is good. I think I should run with it and I think it's worth pursuing and investing in um, yeah but underwater photography is quite expensive but <laughs> I'm still building out my kids I've got two kids now but yeah still building it so uh, any other questions Put your hand up if you've got a question is that it hi hi how do you choose your subjects I've never actually chosen them I know that sounds like a really weird thing to say I'm very lucky to be surrounded by some really powerful women who were happy to support me and get in the water with me at the very start when I was feeling out what this creative vision was and helping it kind of come to life. Like I always knew it was going to be called Wild Fens and I always knew it was women underwater, but I just didn't know where my like space sat, if that makes sense. I have one more question to follow yep. that. Then um, in a lot of your photographs, it's just parts of the body and the movement, but do you, in when you release your photographs, do you, um, in time their storytelling even though you may not see yeah. their faces is there yeah their yeah yeah so when I first yeah, repeat the question oh yeah so she just asked um, often the photos are really ambiguous on purpose they don't show any faces um, and she asked if I ever tell some of their stories because sometimes I t say who they are and I've interviewed some of the people I've shot with and I share their story but when I first started out I actually just did chapters so the first like 13 chapters of Wild Fens was like people I knew that either asked to get in the water with me or I had, you know, said, I'm going to go shooting, do you want to come and play? And they were just like, yeah. And um, when I was in the water, people just open up and they share. And so often I would share snippets of our conversation, still keeping it ambiguous if they didn't want to be um, tagged. But yeah, it's share little parts of their story. Because yeah, I have found that everyone has a story and most often people don't really talk about it, but for some reason in the water, you know, uh, as women, our connection to the water is palpable. It's like, it really just, you know, you'll share your deepest stuff with secrets in the water. You won't want to, but you will. Um, yeah. Thank you for that question. Yeah, really it's lovely. Yeah, empowering for like, people to share this. Like, yeah, like, well, to keep actually. Them, for them to feel like there's, you know, I don't know why we feel like we need permission sometimes, but. 100%. Um, yeah. Do, well, when I was in Fiji just recently, I had a couple of women come up to me and like hug me I haven't shot with them but I got off stage and they hugged me and were crying and I know it sounds really stupid but like I, I knew that the work I was trying to do I wanted it to be meaningful and impactful but I really didn't realize it would have like I wasn't anticipating that much impact and a woman who'd had a double mastectomy with breast and still kind of in recovery from her breast cancer hugged me and just was like the work you're doing it's amazing like I can't wait to shoot with you because like she felt like she wasn't sexy anymore you know we apply these kind of characteristics to features and it's really about your soul um, another woman was going through like a very sort of scary divorce 
and was feeling just like the walls were caving in on her and she said she just got in the water and it just like it felt good to just get it off her chest and just let it all out so and it, a lot of times you might not even realize you're at like a transition or a precipice and in the water it just becomes a bit easier to let like loosen it up a little bit so yeah it's a really beautiful experience right. any other questions oh yeah oh yeah yeah do you want to go yeah, so um, in your presentation, you shared advice that other people have, but do you have any advice to give to creatives? Oh, yeah. She's given a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I can share more. Um, in relation to how to find my wild or how to be a creative? Or either. Um, yeah. I think... As a, I will give you one piece of advice, and I've spoken about this. Sorry, I mentioned my husband a lot, but we work from home together, so it's we bounce off each other a lot. Um, I think like a really big part of being creative is understanding if you want to be like a CEO or if you just want to be a creative, because it's fine and good to have your own, like to be a creative and making. What am I trying to say? Like, is it a hobby or is it a business? See, Wild Femme sits in this weird space of. It started out as a creative outlet, but it's growing in that direction. But I'm, I'm asking myself, do I want to be a CEO? Because as a CEO, those incredible, amazing days are like few and far between the actual exciting work that you do, right? So you need to ask yourself, do I want to do that? Do I want to do that? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, in regards to finding my wild, okay, so this actually, I must recommend everyone do this. So I really had to ask myself, what was the life I was trying to create? Like, what was, I, what was this life by design that I had envisioned? Because if you don't even know what that is, you're kind of just swimming around in circles. So, like, excuse all the analogies in relation to what I didn't actually plan that. Um, uh, you're just swimming around because if you can figure out what that life looks like, even just kind of like, you know, a mild vision, you can work backwards from that and then you need to ask yourself, like, what are the small things I can do every single day that will get me closer to that moment or that space? And I think that really helped me because, and that helped me with this, the, you know, the whole, like, you know, what can I do today? Like, I've got to do a whole heap of boring stuff, but how can I make that fun and more joyful towards other things that I'm trying to work towards? So, yeah, that's probably my two tips for today. What was your question, sorry? Um, you spoke a bit about getting your photography and business off the ground, which is really amazing. But Thank you. also, um, you know, getting a podcast series off the ground is <laughs> yeah. also no small undertaking. Yeah. So I'm just wondering how that process was, getting it off the ground, and um, how did you go about recording the first thing? I'm really good at being busy. So, like, and I think maybe just um, as a producer, uh, and this is probably something that I'm slowly letting go of a little bit, but the hustle lives strong and deep inside you and being able to turn things around really quickly. But I, um, I'm really fortunate that I have a collective of brilliant creatives that I've got great relationships with. So when I decided that I wanted to do the podcast, I know my wheelhouse. I'm not editing that. Yeah. I'm not doing that. You know, I'm not doing that. And, you know, when I built the website, I'm not building the website. Like, I remember I was like, I had just had Goldie. It was like five weeks, ten weeks after having Goldie. And I literally was holding money going, Make my website. You like you make my website. And they were like, it's so easy, and you just do it yourself. And I was like, I don't want to do it myself. <laughs> just take my fucking money. Please. I don't want to do it. Um, so I actually reached out to a brilliant uh, video editor, Jonathan Martin, who I've worked with for a few years now, um, who is incredibly well nuanced in like minority areas, and. He has become almost like a co-producer because I'm very close to the project. I hate hearing no and negative feedback. So when you're producing your own work and, you're, and yourself as the talent, it's kind of, it's a bit foolish actually. So it was really nice to have Jonathan come in who can really clearly go, and also, yeah, I hate cutting stuff out. Like I want to leave it all in, right? And he's like, no, all of that, that half an hour has to go. You know, like, so he just comes in and he's brutally just like chops it all up. Um, so we work really well together. So I think um, finding your people is really great. 
Um, so Jonathan has been such an incredible support for me. So we work really well together. But I, can't, I do it on my own timeline. Like, who says I have to do it every Thursday? So, like, I kind of have a goal of, like, every two weeks. Once I, once I launch, it's, like, every two weeks. But if I miss a week, it's, I'm, I'm not going to get angry at myself. So I think um, the photography, yeah, I think you just, you just start. Like, it doesn't have to be perfect to start either. And, the, like, the beauty of something like a podcast is, like, the more you do, the more people will find you. Because if you only do 10, I've only got 10 in there right now, but, like, I need to build that catalogue so that I do become more discoverable. I'm definitely not a podcast producer, or that's definitely not my space, but I'm an interviewer. I've been interviewing people for nearly 20 years. Like, I'm good at that. So I think I just sort of applied my strengths in my wheelhouse and just joined them with Jono who can pull it all together for me. So I'm lucky in that regard though, yeah. That's all real yeah. time I thought. Guys, um, another huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much.